Hey everybody, how you guys doing? I'm Eric Erlock and this is a little talk about Socrates. A little bit of the Socrates, a little talk, and hopefully not that much hemlock. So Socrates, uh, who lived sometime around 470 to 400 BCE, uh, so about 400, died about 400 years before Jesus was born, is a very famous but controversial and obscure figure. Like a lot of great thinkers of the ancient world, he didn't write his own thoughts down. That's true of many folks, Buddha, Confucius, and others, Jesus, etc. People wrote about them and what they did, uh, but they did not seem to write down their own thoughts, but their sayings were important. But he did teach others. Uh, it was Plato, who lived around 430 to 350, and another philosopher and historian, Xenophon, not Xenophanes, the philosopher we already covered in a previous video. You should watch at some point along with this one, if not before. Uh, Xenophon wrote about Socrates and his teachings also after his death. The third major source of ancient Athenian literature that speaks about Socrates is Aristophanes, who wrote plays mocking Socrates and portraying him as an idi idealistic and somewhat idiotic fool. So Aristophanes also mocks Euripides, the friend of Anaxagoras, for over-employing deus ex machina, which is more the Latin, by lowering him into uh, one of his own plays. And Plato, in his dialogue The Symposium, has Aristophanes argue for Empedocles' theory of proto-human paired beings. Uh, you can look into all of that, the Xenophanes, the Empedocles, at your leisure. So it's generally accepted by scholars that Plato's early dialogues are one of the better sources, uh, if not the best, for understanding Socrates and his ideas. But in Plato's later dialogue, Socrates is a mouthpiece for Plato's own ideas, and Plato is considering the ideas of several others that we already have videos on, including especially Pythagoras and Parmenides. I'm borrowing a lot from them. He did not like Heraclitus, but the other two of the three major pre-Socratics Parmenides and Pythagoras, Plato follows and likes a decent lot. So we'll consider Socrates and his thought first, and then we're going to turn to Plato's dialogues for the next... Uh, well, we'll have several videos on Plato's dialogues following this. So Plato and his student Aristotle were revered by Muslims and Christians and the Judeo-Christian uh, Abrahamic Islamic world, and their texts survived because they were important to the Abrahamic religions and civilizations. I happen to do decent work on history of logic, and ancient and medieval logic is very much Aristotle and Muslims and Christians and Jews doing logic back and forth and debate. And there's other videos about all of that. So it was believed, and still is by many, that Plato and Xenophon were Socrates' students. But new scholarship has shown that this may have not been the case. Plato was a playwright who wrote several unpopular plays before writing the dialogues between Socrates and his students that became celebrated as some of the first and central works of Greek philosophy. Also, Socrates and his uh, peers and jurors and executioners. While Plato never appears in his plays himself, he does put his own family members in roles. He has a character, he has characters mention him as a young devoted follower of Socrates. Um, Diogenes ridiculed Plato, uh, saw his own teacher, uh, Anisthenes, as the true devoted student of Socrates and saw Plato as a foolish and ignorant hijacker of Socrates. There will be a video on Diogenes following. Sometimes I cover Diogenes before Socrates, but technically Diogenes believes himself to be the true follower of Socrates. So what I'm going to do with this series is first comes Socrates, then comes love, then comes marriage, then comes the forms of, of various kinds of love, etc. So first comes Socrates, then comes Diogenes, and then comes Plato and forms and some Aristotle. That's the way we're going to do it, and that's going to be the videos, uh, several videos in for the Greek philosophy class and series here. So originally, Socrates questioned everyone to show that we know very little, and it is the job of philosophers to show this to people, to show how little we know and beyond what we know we don't know, rather skeptically, uh, into subjectivity rather than objectivity of knowledge very much. 
He would argue with others, including famous thinkers and sages, who believed that they possess certain truth and point out the contradictions in their reasoning. This is a lot like Heraclitus telling us to beware experts and being seduced into thinking that one school of thought or perspective is simply correct, but instead continue to investigate the self and world as both have no limit to their depth or the things we can learn. While Socrates did not put forward views of his own, it seems, in how he is mocked by Aristophanes as well as supported by Plato, in his early dialogues, the sources seem to show a Socrates who is rather skeptical and Heraclitean, it seems, without any claims that Socrates studied with Heraclitus at all that I am aware of. How, very much like Xenophanes as well, uh, not Xenophon, but Xenophanes. So Socrates attacks others to show human beliefs are imperfect and incomplete, which does show something like Xenophanes says horses and oxen would carve and paint the gods to look like themselves. Human beliefs are very much human perspectives. Uh, Heraclitus says uh, pigs uh, and, uh, and chickens like to bathe in filth. We don't. Fish love to drink salt water. It's deadly to us. Perspective and forms of life, as Wittgenstein would say. The uh, Socrates seems to be this sort of thinker and very skeptical, but let me attack you, let me attack you, haha, ha, what do any of us know? But Plato does not end up there, does not like Heraclitus, does not like so much Xenophanes, it would seem, definitely does not like Heraclitus by name and supports Parmenides, uh, whom he calls our father at some point, who art in the stillness of being itself and Pythagoras uh, and his ratios and rational intelligent cosmos and proportions and mathematics as, uh, but it gets tricky as we'll get to towards the end of Plato. Plato does not necessarily put his firm foot down firmly in Parmenides, nor does he firmly put his foot down in Pythagoras, although he does both in ways. So what do human words completely tell us, which he is somewhat in the league of? So, that being said, it's also like Zeno, um, that it may be that Parmenides and Zeno think that all thought results in contradiction, which is a little Parmenides versus Pythagoras. So, in Plato's later dialogues, though, in the early dialogues, Socrates in, seems, in, as a character of Plato, to be defeating everyone and showing that nobody knows for certain everything according to everybody. They only know their own forms of life and themselves and how they try towards the good, but they don't know what the form of the good is because they try, they simply find themselves being led towards something good. This sounds also a lot like Anaxagoras, that we are being pulled as if we are a cow and we have our human superior, which is the intelligence and mind of the cosmos. It is pulling us like a dumb ox or a cow, very much like the Zen metaphors of self with ox and taming the ox or not, and then at some point the ox just disappears on us, that you have something like we are being drawn forward as an inferior beast towards intelligence itself, and that is sort of for our bestial self something like a love of the good, and something much more for early Socrates in early Plato, like love itself, drawing us towards good, and we do not know the form of what it is. But Plato later, in what most consider Plato's later dialogues, with all this debatable, but not all thoroughly and completely debated, he ends up much more like Pythagoras and Parmenides, saying there is a still being itself, which technically for Parmenides should mean it does not have divisions in it, but then he also seems to imply heavily that Pythagoras and Timaeus, a Pythagorean, are right about forms of the cosmos and ratios of being itself and the elements a la Empedocles, and he seems to support much of the philosophy we've already had in many of these videos and say that Pythagoras and Parmenides are both right, which is weird. So that is as much as Plato seems to tell us, and you can certainly find Plato saying otherwise in a line or two, but remember these are all plays of dialogue uh, between characters, and so what does Plato himself say exactly? Well, we have to guess what Socrates means in early and latter Socrates for Plato, as best as Plato tells us, and then he can always just believe something beyond what any of his characters say, as far as we know. Plato himself, of course, is very much not in his dialogue saying, I am Plato, I am committed to this view. So we can only judge by what Plato seems to advance in his characters, in his plays. And the later plays are very much not plays. The Symposium is actually a brilliant drama, and it's the most entertaining of Plato's plays. 
a lot else of what Plato does, it, it turns into lectures. He basically uses Socrates. Early Socrates is a brilliant character, almost like uh, Poe's Dupont, I think a bit. Um, but he actually goes from being a trickster and and screwing with everybody to being somebody who allow who himself and then uh, sets sits back and allows others to lecture about the ways that things are according to Pythagoras and others. So. Early Socrates sounds a lot more like Heraclitus, what does anybody know, and he goes around screwing with people. So then Plato uses Socrates to teach increasingly Pythagorean views, and then we don't know if that's all actually true or as much as human beings can understand the universe, which is mathematical. And he ends up hating Heraclitus, but ultimately not arguing that math or the Pythagoreanism is anything other than the human view of the cosmos. It is confusing, but that is, uh, as best as I can present, an educated view on Plato as quickly and simply as possible. He does say there are forms, but he says so a la characters, and ultimately he does believe Parmenides somehow is correct and all is one, which means, in some sense, math is our imperfect human views of things. Which could mean Heraclitus was right all along, in a sense, and actually objectivity is mere human collective subjectivity. It would seem. But we have early Socrates just defeating people's views, latter Socrates turning increasingly, and Plato's latter dialogues turning increasingly into speeches about how it seems the cosmos seems to be this away, that away, that away. In the Republic, Socrates very much turns in the early part from being a questioner to in the latter part being a more answerer. How dogmatic does that make Plato? Well, these are his characters and how he seems to use Socrates. So, unlike Parmenides and Zeno, Plato's later Socrates seems to believe we can know the eternal truth as having a proportional form, such that time and difference are not mere illusions. The form of the good is eternal, so it does not change with time, but it does have a distinct shape. But again, how much is he allowing for Parmenides to say it's all one and all shape or difference to it is mere illusion? Any difference and any change in it is in our fallen perspective, perhaps. We know very little about Socrates' early life other than the details supplied in Plato's works. He mentions several influences, including, centrally, two women. Women occupy very little of the public sphere in ancient Greece and ancient Athens. Uh, ancient Greece is not known for being a very much so, the word progressive is wrong here, because here we don't know whether we're talking about earlier or latter uh, women's positions and things. Um, but because we have uh, societies turning into empire and more patriarchal, certainly, um, how egalitarian or not, or matriarchal were they? Well, Socrates mentions that he learned from two women who do not have speaking parts in Plato's plays, nor do women. Uh, he says that he learned from the shaman or witch or priestess, Diatima, uh, who taught him about love and how it is central to life in the cosmos, which sounds like Empedocles. Love is the central gravitational, uh, ethereal force that draws Isaac Newton and apples and everything and ourselves and love together and the planets. Socrates also gives credit to Aspasia, the mistress of the general Pericles, uh, whom he says taught him rhetoric. Socrates was like almost everyone else in Plato's dialogues, an aristocrat who knew politicians and the wealthy, or it seems it. Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle lived at a time when the glory days of Athens were in decline, and Socrates did fight for the military, which means that he would have had uh, been wealthy enough to own weapons and pledge and thus be part of the public uh, decently with a certain sort of uh, distinct role here. Um, so... We, Socrates' career as a philosopher famously began when his friend uh, Chirophon went to the Oracle of Delphi to ask if anyone was wiser than his friend Socrates, possibly because Socrates had been driving him nuts. Socrates, with, a char with his characteristic modesty, which often seems false and seems like he is being a trickster, well, I wouldn't want to parade my children in front of you. Here they are right here, by the way, at my trial. He seems to be mocking us and everyone all the time as a gadfly, as a trickster as a stingray. So, uh, Socrates says, this is a very crass question at his trial. Uh, why would he ask the gods about me? I'm nobody, let me tell you. Um, I'm just a simple country lawyer. Again, I do have to do the bit a little bit with Socrates because he is constantly the my it is hot today routine. The oracle replied to Chirophon, no one is wiser than Socrates. 
And hearing this, Socrates says, either genuinely or with false modesty, that he was very troubled because he does not believe he is very wise at all, and yet this would mean that humanity is quite ignorant. Of course, this sounds like he already knew that and was like, well, yeah, you know, but let me go around and stick it to everybody and show everybody this in their face. So he goes around and wandering, debating others, seeking and, uh, someone wiser than himself. So we're to, to prove it wrong by elimination. Here again, we have in India, Greece, and China, we very much have a kung fu master mentality here, if I may say, where if you are great, you have to wander around to the other schools and find these other philosophers. And that's what Plato's dialogues are. That's what the dialogues of the Buddha are, the long discourses and uh, some of the middle ones, etc is that the Buddha and Socrates and others have to go around Chinese philosophers and find and fight these other philosophers because that shows that they can argue, can fight, can debate. Logic of the ancient world was not a form of math. It was debate and the ability to speak and thus reason. Uh, it very much has to do with the central role speaking plays in reasoning. We don't search our minds uh, through giant images. I'm not sure if uh, photographic memory is even a thing anymore. It was, uh, when I was growing up, considered to be a thing. Um, but we don't really search images much. We could train ourselves to. But we very much talk out our reasoning. So debate is who can talk and thus fight the best with talk and debate and argue in front of others. Sometimes rich people, sometimes poor people, sometimes out in public, sometimes in the wealthiest of places. So Socrates needs to, is giving himself an excuse like the Buddha and the texts about early Buddha and others. He needs excuses here to go around and fight with others no matter what happens. So he needs to go around and the text is going to present him like it presents Jesus and other people of the ancient world as finding this person and that person and then this is their follower and then this is an opponent they defeated. It is very much drawing the history out such that the text is showing us these people lived comprehensive lives. The text is picking out the most important events of their lives, which is who they opposed and who they helped and why and who helped them and who opposed them and why. And that shows you the triangulation of the human thought forming in its ways. So... Socrates, like Anaxagoras, was charged with impiety. He did believe in the oracle and in the gods, though. He says at his trial, which is accusing him of not believing the gods, that I've been doing nothing but try to prove the god and or gods right. That's been the whole thing I've been doing as a good, faithful polytheist, as good Republican dad. I was proving the gods exist. You know, I was doing the traditional thing. Why do you guys have me up in front of everybody saying I'm some kind of anarchist? I am proving the polytheistic gods are correct about everything. Although I am quasi saying this is sort of monotheistic -y, which is plenty popular at the time also that it's sort of truth meaning being itself as the gods very much like Heraclitus says of course you know I'm just doing what the gods are telling me here um, his last wish in the Apology, before drinking Hemlock, uh, in Plato's uh, play, not the Apology actually, the, I believe the Credo I'm going to change the notes, uh, was that a rooster should be sacrificed to Asclepius, the mystical god of Greek healing, um, who is associated with Thoth, the Egyptian god of knowledge, as Renaissance Italians, who may not have called themselves Italians, rather Florentine, uh, would have said, um, and associated with Egypt, etc., and the Persians and the Magi visiting the baby Jesus, and all sorts of interesting things. Um, Socrates seems to have viewed his death as the cure of a condition, and that's why he's sacrificing a rooster to a polytheistic god as his final act. And this is more proof that uh, for these Greeks who are dabbling, um, as are Indian and Chinese philosophers, between polytheism and monotheism in the world, in much in world history, as well as doing many other things, uh, they are asking about truth and being and meaning as they are trying to figure out how much are the forces of things, society, and the cosmos one unified coherent thing or several warring factions and forces, which is a major, major human structure of human thought uh, throughout human history all over the world. It's from Asclepius that we get the image of snakes wound around a staff as a symbol for medicine and healing, which is then often mixed with the cross uh, that you see uh, outside of hospitals today, etc., uh, Asclepius, I believe, is supposed to be the son of Apollo. So Apollo is the god of, was a shepherd god, then increasingly became a knowledge science god. And Asclepius gets to be god of mysticism as well as of healing, which is seeking out and diagnosing. And then it's mystically, you may need to be re-diagnosed, you know, at some point, because it's speculative, you know, the best of medicine, which is good, because that's what you want the shaman or the doctor to do. So Socrates felt that he knew nothing, but he questioned the ex experts of Athens. He came up, uh, and he came upon a horrible discovery and a paradox. The experts believed themselves to be wise and possess great knowledge, but when questioned, it turned out they knew very little. When 
Uh, Socrates knew that he himself knew nothing, so he discovered that he was wiser than those who thought that they knew, because he knew that they knew nothing. Now, this is a point where it is in Book 2 of the Republic, it seems, where Socrates somewhat turns from this and says, you know, I'm sick of saying nobody knows anything at all. Let's start putting stuff together more firmly, analogously, via metaphor. And there's a bit of shadow puppets involved, it would seem, and a bit of noble lies. But at the same time, he does turn to, so I've upset everybody by just saying nobody knows anything at all. Okay, let me now start talking about what can we build communally. And he starts to talk like a very different figure in the Republic. Um, but in the Apology, which many uh, would consider to have been written by Plato before the Republic, because it is Plato writing about what actually happened to Socrates before he then uses him as a character goes back in time and has Socrates grow up and have different dialogues with different people at different points, Plato seems to jump around in time. It is not that he writes Socrates as a boy and then works to his death. He actually starts with his death, it seems, and then jumps, which, which Plato knew about and was a big issue at the time for Athens and Athenians. And then he jumps around uh, in time, uh, trying to figure out when Socrates did this and that. My favorite and a favorite of French philosophy is the Parmenides dialogue of Plato, where he has it flash back to boy Socrates. And uh, Parmenides, who has Zeno right there, tells uh, boy Socrates, as I mentioned with Parmenides, the Eleatics, and Zeno, if you argue X is Y and not Y, Z is A and not A, B is C and not D and E and F, you will become unstoppable. And anybody watching that play would probably know from Plato's other work and from uh, the recent cultural historical events of the area and the stuff. If you were hearing that play and understanding it, you would know that Socrates grew up into a guy that was so unstoppable they decided to kill him off, or at least that's what it would seem to suggest while using him as a central main hero-like character. Although by that point in the dialogue, Socrates is stepping to the side and allowing himself to be lectured by Parmenides and Aristoteles, which isn't two Aristotles in a trench coat stacked on top of each other trying to get into an R-rated movie. It's actually uh, one of Aristotle and now there are two of them. Yes, the, uh, I have yet to flash horrible memes at people, although I do have the scumbag Socrates meme in the notes like a chump that says claims to know nothing demolishes your argument. So, yes, we'll do an immaterial dab without arms and such. So, Socrates is going around and he discovers early that he doesn't know anything and neither do any of these other people, so is he then waiting to build stuff later and it's all consistent, or does he flip in Plato's dialogues? Because it seems like he does. Humble and modest Socrates was aware that mortal humans know nothing, but the philosophers, politicians, artists, and warriors were unaware of this great equality they shared with him. The ignorance of him and Socrates was thus the greatest wisdom in all of Athens, knowing what you do not know. It is certainly true that the more one knows, the more one knows that there is an endless amount to know, and that we are all quite evil in knowing very little, even when there is a great deal that we can know. Um, the Taoists say we can rest in the he in the cosmos, the equalizer, which is very, and they believe in holding themselves very low and being uncarved blocks of, st of wood and being uncarved stone and being fools and acting uh, foolish because they are very, in ways, the Taoists of China, quite Socratic uh, in their attitudes, which is somewhat Diogenes and his more beatnik flipping off the squares most directly. This video is again for children. Um, so by flipping off, I mean doing a backflip into the pool, you know, in Athens, uh, of course. And Diogenes takes it a little bit more extreme to the beatnik performance artist level, which we will do next uh, after finishing this, and then we will move on to doing dialogue by dialogue of Plato. So I am not going to get into detail about the Apology or the Crito right here. That will be in the next few videos. So there is another paradox here, a very interesting one. The more one surpasses others in wisdom, becoming different, the more you identify with them and see yourself as common with them. Love and wisdom are complementary. This is also very much like the Taoists of China. The more you know, the wiser you get, not just knowledge, but perspective. The more perspective you gain as well as knowledge, possibly complementary, possibly one at the expense of the other, the more you realize with a somewhat Cassandra complex that the farther out you go, the more we are all so much the same that one should rest very much in the smartness and ignorance of humanity, which is quite constant, which creates an interesting thing such that the, the higher up you are, the more the same you are like everyone, which means the more common and base you act because the less you are trying to distinguish yourself with pride from others. 
This is a kind of interesting cycle. It might be vicious if one doesn't like it. You find this, uh, and then Diogenes takes this to even greater extremes. It is a very interesting thing, though, thinking about pride, narcissism, uh, Bodhidharma, who supposedly brought Zen from India to China originally, says that the tallest thing in the cosmos is the self, but the widest thing is the mind. Is it that the more we see, the less and less pride we have, and that is the greater and greater we are? And how does that work in us? Well, Socrates seems to display that, and there is a lot in Chinese and Indian thought also, as well as Socrates here, central to Plato and Aristotle's work, as well as then they speak in ways beyond him, that there is something incredible in wisdom where the more you are of it, the more you realize you do not have to be any different from the common human mind, which I find quite zen and quite good for teaching philosophy. The more philosophy you know, the more you can see the common human mind such that it gives you power over your and others' minds. If that is true, that is thought and wisdom itself, in a sense, which is actually part of the reason why I call my site Thought Itself is because thinking itself is very much everything in the view of everything. So the better you become with it, the more it is everything, and thus why need stand out. There is a lot there that is, uh, or why not see things according to whomever, because you can always go back and forth with anything. That itself creates a kind of lowly, modest position, which Socrates and the Taoists take to be a very uh, directive, and Diogenes thinks the same, to go out and be a stingray and screw with others. And again, some people more, some people less, and, and uh, again, Yoko Ono has been famous for screaming at people, again, which I think is a legitimate work if you can get it, you know, still. Um, so yeah, I try to scream at people softly and gently about all of this stuff. So yeah. The, uh, let's see here. So uh, Socrates is very much here like Heraclitus, that experts say they know a lot, but then when you question experts, you find that they know a lot about some things, but they then tend to talk as if they know things about everything when in fact they only know things about that part. So it isn't just that we blank don't know anything at all, although you could take some of this to that extreme and still make it work, I think. Basically, somebody who's a shoemaker knows shoes, somebody who is a chemist knows chemistry, but they will talk as if, because they know their toe of the elephant, a la the Janes of India metaphor, that they really know the whole elephant, and that is something the Janes would warn us about, the Taoists of China would warn us about, and something Socrates goes around as the gadfly and the stingray screwing with people with, and being a jokester, a trickster, and a joker, and a midnight... Uh, symposiast, I suppose. Yes? That is toes or roses. So, he also, like Heraclitus, seems to talk about a wisdom beyond the gods, which is the gods, and he doesn't seem to question polytheism while also speaking beyond it, which he seems to think is complementary to polytheism and the traditional view of the gods, but many would think is uh, sacrilegious and impious, which is what he and Anaxagoras are charged with. And he says, what? Am I Anaxagoras? What's with you guys? So... It doesn't say the gods aren't real. It is talking about sort of truth being itself and wisdom, and that is somewhat monotheistic, which is why Plato and Aristotle are polytheists who are very important to the Abrahamic Judeo-Christian Islamic world. So, uh, great city-states had risen and fallen, um, rise and fall of empires, and much of human wisdom is, the ri is in the rise and falls of em falling of empires and people saying, wow, how do we not do that or what? And questioning the ways of things and having more freedom to do that and more urgency to do that, even in dangerous times when you can be killed for doing that, which is what happened to Socrates. And again, they tried to completely eliminate Confucius's works and he was chased around the country. And again, many of people have risked their lives around the world to try to widen people's perspective uh, throughout, uh, and then those figures are remembered, even if they are killed. They couldn't find uh, Confucius to poison him completely. Um, he died of old age, I believe. So, but Socrates decided to stay, and, and uh, well, you came, you saw, and you left, um, as we already had here. So, we'll mention that again with the Socrates, um, with the Plato dialogues. Socrates does not argue that we are hopelessly ignorant. But like Heraclitus, we should continue to examine ourselves, seek truth, and strive for the good. 
all of these thinkers, by the way, do not say nihilistically, just start smashing everything. Just go with your uh, random desires because, hey, falling apart is totally fine. There are other thinkers who might react in that way. They are interesting. Um, all of these thinkers would say, but you do want to strive towards some kind of common goodness, even if many of them, like Taoists and Heraclitus, would say, but the goodness is the badness, and be that wise. That there is something common and unitive that they are seeking, something tranquil and good which brings about something. But then can they say that? It is uh, decent enough to debate. So Socrates does argue you should accept, and we, sh we should all accept, our ignorance and the guidance of the world through intuition. He does seem an intuitionist, like Brouwer with mathematics. He believed that he had a spirit, a daimon, which is very close to the word demon, uh, because demon is actually somewhat related to daimon. Um, the spirits of the old become the, the demons of the new, etc., in many ways, um, in human cultures. And that he had a higher self or mind or soul that he talked with and dialogued with back and forth. Vygotsky, the Russian Piaget, uh, of the uh, Soviet Union of the 20s and 30s said that we talk to ourselves as we learn to talk to others. So the child says the horse goes in the barn, but then the child learns to talk out their own world to themselves as they learn to dialogue to others. And so we dialogue to ourselves to talk to ourselves as if we are arguing. I often think of people of my past who I am arguing with or talking about issues with, or now that I've been talking, uh, teaching a classroom, especially now that I'm talking into a camera, I think about the classroom and moments I've had there where people have liked or hated what I'm thinking and said, and so then I start talking towards that and those people. Socrates talks to his higher self, which he has conversations with, and at some point he is out in the garden uh, talking to himself. I believe uh, it's either the Symposium or the Republic, I forget exactly, that is sad. Uh, but he is out there and says, where's Socrates? Get that guy in here. Oh, he's out talking to his higher self, his daimon, his spirit, his inner demon. Uh, that he is uh, talking things out with all of that, you know. So how much do you talk to yourself, your others, and yourself? Uh, internally, externally, all that. Of course, empiricists would say, uh, like Vygotsky and Piaget, that we really don't talk internally in ways we've, and with words we've never heard. We talk internally ways we've interacted with others externally very, very much. That is something always wise to think, if we think we're so private and internal all the time. So the spirit is also what others would call a conscience, which is more Latin-based, a conscience, a, uh, a with-seeingness, um, a higher inner seeing self, fire, light thing, self-being, what have yous, um, which we do and don't understand in ancient and modern times as what yourself is with another light mind fire thing, a co-seeing, um, which you then, uh, much like a Roman would say, my genius has said whatever my genie for Muslims is some kind of Robin Williams routine, which is inspiring, you know, to all. Still, again, guy was too awesome for this world. So, again, we, uh, yes, conscience, co-seeing, genius, higher daimon, demon, uh, spirit, self, and Socrates would talk it out. So Socrates does believe in something, uh, although, what does he believe entirely? Um, it's good to ask. He does seem to practice process and processes with others and with himself. So he certainly does that. At first, he does not seem to hold many beliefs. But we will talk out this because he is back and forth and contradicts himself and is strange in Plato's dialogues as Plato's character. So that said, uh, it is a bit like the Christian angel and demon on the shoulders, although they're sort of not on top of the head, not just one thing or what have you. Um, a little Zoroastrian, even Zervanite. Uh, the Zoroastrian heresy of Persia long before these guys, well, not long, before these guys in which the devil and God are two twins or something, which is one of the only, I guess that's a, uh, there's polytheism and there's monotheism, and I guess there's du duotheism. Not sure. So Socrates says his, his daimon, his spirit, his self, his inner critic, told him to stay out of politics, which would be good advice, seeing as how his death was kind of political. So not only did politics get him killed in spite of this, but Plato has Socrates get increasingly political in his later dialogues, particularly in the Republic, where Socrates debates the best form of the city. It is an analogy. I had a student recently say it's not so political, and that's true, um, because it is an analogy for the self. And supposedly Plato tried it out politically, though, at some point a bit, and it didn't really take. So uh, under a guy who turned out to be a bit of a tyrant. 
So Plato may not have known Socrates so much if he is increasingly using him as a mouthpiece for his own ideas and speculating as to what Socrates would have thought, which is rather what any of us would think about him. Um, Socrates does stay consistent uh, in Plato of praising the divinity of poetry, mysticism, love, and hanging out and drinking a bit with friends, as he does in the Symposium, in a dialogue about a drinking party that turns into a philosophical discussion about the nature of love, which Diotima supposedly taught Socrates uh, as a voiceless female character, uh, the somewhat sidelined, uh, that is the Empedoclean force of uh, that gravitally bind, uh, gravitationally binds us and the world and meaning and life together in all of these forms. So that's enough of Socrates and that for now. We're next going to have Diogenes, and then we will flash around in time with Plato through his dialogues, and we will go in order of Plato's dialogues from early to late to keep Plato's thought as Plato, which means we will not be presenting Plato's dialogues in order as how they seem to have happened to Socrates, or present that as Socrates. Rather, we're going to do Diogenes, and, and him mocking Plato and saying he gets Plato wrong, and then we will start laying out Plato early and later Plato, and you can think what you think about all that. So much happiness. Uh, I hope that you have enjoyed this, and please check out my other videos on Indian, Greek, and Chinese philosophy, and we will be following with more on modern European philosophy, etc., and logic next semester. Much happiness, and I guess uh, go around and question the heck out of, out of everybody until they force-feed you hemlock, you know? So again, good night, and good luck, sweet people.